So let's talk about our story, Sarah. Uh, in a recent <laughs> article in Edutopia, neurologist Judy Willis and educator Jay McTie discussed what neuroscience is telling us about what teachers can do to help capture their students' attention when introducing new topics in class. The trick, they note, is to say and do things that activate the student's reticular activating system, or RAS, which is done through introducing new, curious, and unexpected actions. Some activities that the authors recommend include doing something out of the ordinary when starting the lesson, like wearing something unique or bringing in an unusual object. Presenting odd facts at the start of a lesson can be useful too. Inviting students to make predictions about what will happen next in a lesson can trigger a dopamine release in the student, and tying a lesson to something like current events in the world can pique students' interests and inspire discussion. In closing, the authors note that while it is important to hook your student's attention at the start of the lesson, don't lose sight of the real goal, which is to keep that attention over time. Quote, there are numerous ways to capitalize on initial attention by employing active learning strategies, including the use of authentic tasks and projects, inquiry-oriented instruction, cooperative learning, Socratic seminars, simulations, and role plays, and design thinking, e.g. using maker spaces where students can create tangible products, and allowing students appropriate voice and choice options in assignments and performance tasks. Well, it wouldn't surprise me, Sarah, that both of us would find this story pretty dang interesting. Always cool to be able to bring a little bit of neuroscience to the work that educators do. Uh, it sounds like you were as blown away by this as I was. I was I was really excited to hear that there's a lot of of neuroscience behind it but I'll be honest a lot of times when I read articles with recommendations like this I as a classroom teacher would get a little disheartened because I didn't really see myself as a good performer for lack of a better term and I think that there is a level of of performance or or um, entertainment value that sometimes underlies some of these recommendations. And I think what I really liked about this article was the emphasis on not just doing things, you know, kind of sh for shock value, hooking them, but that holding of their attention. And I always say it's really important not just to do engagement strategies, but to engage students with content. And so the idea here of making connections, inviting predictions, posing provocative questions that tie them back to what they're learning is the really critical piece. Coming into class dressed as Shakespeare might be really fun, but how is that getting them actually interested in reading Shakespeare for a 90 minute class period? So I like the the intensity of making sure that it's not just something that gets them interested for a second, but will hold their attention with these authentic tasks. And to me, what's key in doing that is, you know, one, as you noted, not just having all sizzle and no steak. You still have to bring the excellent content and find ways to use these different learning strategies to maintain the student's attention throughout. But when I've seen teachers do this kind of stuff really well, it's when they have the attention grabber in the beginning, but then they use that attention grabber as a thread throughout the lesson so that you don't you lose sight of it. I remember once I had a uh, social studies teacher in high school who was talking to us about some kind of global event and uh, some sort of conflict somewhere in the Middle East. And instead of just sort of introducing the topic, he just started by telling us a story of a little boy in Syria and you know, what his day-to-day -day life was growing up. And then as he was then bringing it into a broader story of what was going on in Syria, he was then coming back to the little boy and talking about how the uh, global events there were affecting his day-to-day -day life. And so, yeah, the the initial story grabbed our attention, but he found a way to connect that initial attention-grabbing event to all the content that he was bringing us, and it really grabbed our attention. It was a you know, powerful storytelling and pedagogical tool. That's awesome. I think in language arts, which is something I taught for a long time, it's it's also easier to make some of those connections, right? To, I always say it's important for us as we're reading to make connections to the world around us, to other things that we've read, to our own lives. But even when we're talking about things that 
maybe don't have an obvious tie to the real world. I know there's like a lot of famous memes going around where it's like another day where I'm not using the Pythagorean theorem, right? Like <laughs> just, just some of these jokes. It's like I How can't do, do we... my taxes, but I know mitochondria is the powerhouse right, the of the cell. Right, the powerhouse of the cell. We all know it, right? <laughs> How do we ensure engagement with content in those kinds of situations where maybe there isn't yet or immediately or obviously a connection that they can make. And I think the idea of productive struggle is something that I love to come back to because bringing in a problem, bringing in, like I think you mentioned problem-based learning or some project-based learning in uh, that was shared in the article, bringing in something that is happening and how the little things that you're learning today is impacting that and how you will get there because these are the steps to get there. You know, we know the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell and we're going to kind of talk about this ridiculous question and I promise that one day this is going to come together and you're going to see, I'm going to build maybe a ladder. I'm going to show you, you know, people who do things like backwards planning or understanding by design, these, these curriculum planning templates use these little things to show how learning all of these things together are going to make up something larger. And reading in this article, some of the things that they presented to do those kinds of things are something I would have never thought of to bring into a classroom. But I have to say it has one of my favorite things I've ever read in a recommendation based on brain science, which was to pose the question, does a fart contain DNA? <laughs> It you, not only go ahead. No, no I was saying you, you would have junior high Ryan's undivided attention. You I, have it, uh, in his thirties Ryan undivided right. attention with, so it, that's with what it. I, it. It not only made me laugh, <laughs> it made me think. Yeah. And now I need to do some homework to find the answer to that because I I was like, wait, I I, I could see this. I could say, well, hold on. Does it have? You know, and I don't want to get, you know, too graphic on the book. Does it have fecal matter? Does fecal matter continue your DNA? What, how do they test for this? How do they test? For, but that, I, you know, I know this about this and that and the other. And so it's just all of these things going through your head. And now I'm engaging with content, not just something that is ridiculous to get my attention or to make kids giggle. But now I'm really thinking, okay, well, what did I learn about the mitochondria? What did I learn about DNA? What did I learn about this, that, and the other? that is actually gonna matter in today's conversation. I think a close cousin of the attention grabbing technique in the instruction is using a quick <laughs> preliminary assessment at the beginning of a lesson to not only grab students' attention, but allow you to gauge sort of where your students are with the subject matter. To give you another example from my social studies life, I remember uh, coming across a sixth grade geography teacher who before he would do his uh, unit on Africa, would begin the lesson with a preliminary assessment, get every sheet, every student to take out a sheet of paper and have the student write down every single country in Africa they could name from memory. Like, what are the countries in Africa that you know? And obviously, you know, sixth graders who grew up in the United States aren't going to know too many African countries by name. Maybe, you know, some students will get a dozen, some students might only get a couple, but that already gets their wheels turning about the unit, gets the students understanding, wow, I have so much to learn about this continent. And as an instructor, you have a nice little preliminary assessment to know where your students are in the unit. And uh, you can use that stuff to guide your instruction. So you get attention grabbing and you get an assessment all in one. And for those of you who are looking back at your, your textbooks from education classes, activating prior knowledge, building schema, that's all part of those components that get knowledge to to stick in yeah. the brain, right? That's the very technical way of saying it, to stick. <laughs> awesome, yeah.